River running is exciting. After running some of the wildest rivers in the United States, like the Selway, the Salmon, the Green, the Colorado River through Grand Canyon, our desire to run even larger rapids takes us to South America in search of rivers never before run by man. In Cuenca, Ecuador, Bob Moran and I contact an American pilot, Jack Wesson, who agrees to fly us in his Cessna 170 over the Amazon basin of the Oriente in Ecuador and Peru. An aerial view of these river tributaries may reveal to us the exciting white water for which we search. First to the capital city of Guayaquil to secure permission to fly over the Amazon basin. lurching bus ride through town turns out to be as wild as some of the rivers we run. It seems the driver must punch a time card or lose his job. Once this is accomplished, we continue to the government offices at a much more leisurely pace. With the papers secured for Ecuador, we fly over the barren west coast of Peru to Lima to secure permission from that country also. It seems there is a dispute between Ecuador and Peru as to just where the border lies in the jungle. And they both have army posts stationed here and will shoot down any unidentified and unauthorized aircraft. At the Lima airport, the local pilots give us a brief mapping, and it seems there is only one pass low enough in these high Andes mountains through which our Cessna 170 can fly. Extra fuel will be required. It is placed behind the seat with a fuel line over the wing so they can switch gas tanks in flight. about 15 minutes in the air when suddenly the oil pressure gauge drops and we quickly return to the airport to have it checked. It's a good thing we're not over the mountains as we have a broken piston. Well this plane's out of service and we're quite discouraged at being suddenly grounded. Another pilot and plane are located. This time we won't take any chances. We now have a plane that has two engines. However, on takeoff, there is a strange noise in the left engine. In checking it, I find our starter is broken on takeoff. Repairs delay us a few hours, but at last we're on our way. We skim across the peaks of the Andes, well over 20,000 feet high. basin with its lush green valleys and many river tributaries, all leading into the Amazon River itself. However, our search is disappointing, as these calmly meandering streams do not have the deep, narrow canyons with the rushing rapids that we want to run. We decide to return to southern Mexico and challenge a section of the Grijalva River never before run by man, which we had previously scouted. The flight back to Lima is a nervous one as we're shrouded by clouds and temporarily lose our vision. The mountains around us are higher than we are and there's a chance we might crash into them. We radio to Lima, giving our position just in case. Arriving in Lima at sunset, we send a telegram to the other 14 members of the expedition 
requesting them to bring our truck and equipment to Tuxla Gutierrez, a town in southern Mexico. We fly from Lima to Mexico, and at the airport, we are greeted by a marimba band. However, we soon learn the band is not for us, but to welcome movie stars from Mexico City who are on the plane with us. Our Western River Expeditions truck has driven some 4,000 miles from Salt Lake City, Utah, with all the necessary river running equipment. We stay at the Hotel Bonham Park, eating in the sidewalk cafes. They have delicious food here, and the waiter suggests we try steak with a special green sauce on it. The markets of Mexico are fascinating, not only for their mountains of food, but as showplaces for arts and crafts that are centuries old. One of the most ancient of native arts in Mexico is the making of jica paisley. Thousands of grub-like worms are boiled into an oily paste, dyed black, and rubbed on the outside of gourds to preserve them. The gourds are then hand-decorated with flowers and will last for centuries if properly done. Many imitation hika paisleys exist today, painted with black enamel paint instead of the boiled worms for the background. And this woman is one of the few people who still make genuine hika paisley. Good food will be important to the success of our trip, and apples, strawberries, and grapes will enhance our river trip menu. But we pass up the fish eggs. These would appear unappetizing to us, even without the many flies around. This young girl, who gives us permission to take her picture, proves to be as self-conscious as most of us are in front of the camera. Short drive from Tuxla takes us to the El Sumidero lookout point, 4,000 feet above the Grijalva River. A glimpse of the raging rapids from this height is deceiving, but Max Singleton and I map them as best we can. Since El Sumidero Canyon is only 17 miles long, many river parties have attempted to go through here, all unsuccessfully, and some with loss of life. We cannot see all the rapids from the lookout point, so we charter a plane to fly over the canyon to get a better look at El Sumidero from the air and chart the rest of the rapids. El Sumidero Canyon and the Rio Grijalva were discovered in 1518 by Juan Grijalva, a Spanish explorer. The name El Sumidero means the drain, and a local story claims that 2,000 Indians jumped from the canyon rim rather than submit to Spanish slavery. The rapids look as treacherous from the air as from the rim, but we're satisfied that those few rapids we can't run by boat, we can at least walk around. Arriving at the river's edge, we unload the square metal cans that contain our food. The round coolers have ice and perishable products in them. The mayor of Tuxla has sent us aerial maps of the canyon, but they don't tell us much, for even the local people know very little about what's in the bottom of El Sumidero Canyon. Our boats, rubber pontoons, are military surplus used in World War II for bridge supports.
takes a lot of hard work to pump them up by hand, and when inflated, they are 25 feet long, 8 feet wide, and weigh about 600 pounds. A square wooden oarlock rigging will support the plywood floor where we put our heavy cargo. The governor's helicopter arrives, bringing the governor of the state of Chiapas to wish us good luck on our journey through the canyon. This small boat will be used to go back and forth across the river to survey the rapids from both sides. The governor has given us his personal rifle to use as protection in the canyon, for no one knows for sure what lies in the bottom of El Sumidero. Oars to steer the raft are mounted on steel pins, and life jackets will be worn by everyone 100% of the time while we're on the river. It's the adventure of a lifetime for most men to go into an unexplored area and everyone is full of anticipation as our rafts push off from shore. The waters of the Grijalva are very slow and deceiving at first, but we know what lies ahead in the canyon below. The roughest white water man has yet to run. Our crew is made up of professional boatmen and men who have been on many trips with us in the United States. And everyone has one thing in common, the spirit of adventure. We'll stop and look at the first rapid, trying to find a safe path through it. We'll run the first few hundred yards of white water, with Ralph Whitford near the shoreline to throw a rope to the raft as it comes by, so it can be tied to the oarlock and help pull the boat to shore. Below this rapid lies a 21-foot waterfall, and the men want to be sure that they don't go over it. Bob Moran, Paul Thevin, and I cross the river in a small boat to shoot pictures from the other side. As we are returning, the boat suddenly overturns in midstream, dumping the three of us into the turbulent river. I swim for shore, making it just before going over the falls. Bob Moran and Paul, still hanging onto the boat, float up to the edge of the falls, and the boat catches on a rock and log, stopping it from going over the falls. Bob is able to stay with the boat and crawl out on top. Our Paul is not so fortunate. He is swept over the waterfall. Helping Bob to shore, he and I go as high as we can along the canyon ridge, looking down into the river below, trying to find Paul to see if he's still alive. 200 yards below, we can see him bobbing up and down, floating towards shore. We try to work our way down to him. The Sumidero does not lend itself to walking, and we find it an impossible task to reach Paul, though we finally see him moving on a beach and know he is alive. It's going to take another two days of lining and portaging over this rapid to reach him. The three of us are stranded across the river from the main party, cold and hungry, watching the warm fire across the way. The next morning, the main group devises a plan to get us back to them. Clyde Morgan casts his fishing line across the river many times and is finally successful in reaching us. A nylon rope is then tied to the fishing line and pulled across the river.
Bob scribbles a quick note requesting a can with another camera and some food be sent to us. We then retrieve the small boat, tie it to the line, and use this method to get back across the river to the main party. We must now line the boats over this rapid, which we've named Falls Falls. Watch this 800-pound boat taking the same path that Paul took in his life jacket. The boats all have lines tied to them, and the lines are tied to rocks on the shore to stop them. Boat number two, full of water weighing many tons, stops on a rock. But we are able to pull it free. Boat number three meets with disaster. The oarlock rigging breaks as it drops over the waterfall, and the steel oar pin cuts two of the eight air chambers. to leave this boat behind. It will take too much time to repair it. This means we'll have to throw away much of our equipment. All clothing except what we're wearing must be left behind. Much of our food, whatever can be spared. Everything that remains, including the passengers, will have to be placed into two boats. With the boats at the bottom of Paul's Falls, We'll now have to portage all of our equipment around the rapid. This is hard, dreary work and takes us another day. But we finally reach Paul and find that he has a broken eardrum, a concussion, and ragged clothes from being caught underneath the falls. A shot from Dr. Robert Preston makes him almost as good as new. It's time for a quick dip in the waters of the Grijalva before running the next rapid. We first must run a stretch of rapids about 100 yards long before we pull our boats out above a 65-foot waterfall. We name it Rat Trap Rapids because of the narrow opening very difficult to get to. In the process of squeezing our boat between these two rocks, she fills full of water, making it very heavy and unmanageable. In fact, it's too heavy to row to shore. We have boatmen stationed along the bank, throwing ropes to the boat, trying to stop the boat before it goes over the 65-foot drop. The ropes are not holding. You can see them breaking and a very frantic crew signals for help. The last rope pulls the boat in just above the falls. This is the path they would have taken had they not made it to shore. Bill Dumar, one of the men in the boat, has received a bad rope burn from one of the snapping lines. Tom Lee bails out our raft in preparation for the portage around the falls. From the 4,000-foot lookout spot on the rim, the boulders didn't look too large. But down here, carrying 800-pound boats over them, they seem gigantic. Dick Preston and Bill Gibbs count one, two, and on three, the entire crew lifts, pushes, and pulls to make the boat move.
after a few hours, we're exhausted in the tropical heat. Our crew begins to get a little discouraged because our portages are taking so much time and are so much more difficult than we thought they would be. With the boats now at the bottom of Portage Falls, it is necessary to take an equal amount of time, maybe a little longer, to carry all of our equipment around the falls. Our original plan was to take 11 days to run the 17 miles of El Sumidero Canyon, plus 60 miles of river below El Sumidero through a canyon called Malpaso. At this juncture of our trip, we have been out seven days and have gone only one and three quarter miles into the canyon. Since we're so far behind schedule, we're going to take a chance and run this turbulent rapid. We name it First Ride Rapid. day today. At last a major rapid we didn't have to portage. We don't even mind having river water punch and peanut butter and jam sandwiches for lunch today. Everyone is happy from Clyde Morgan, the youngest member of the group at 19, to Arthur Dusenberry, the oldest, at age 57. The exhilaration of first ride rapids soon wears off with another portage. This is the real story of the Sumidero expedition. The courage and determination of a group of men to go every inch into the canyon they possibly can before time, food, and energy run out. They tackle the impossible task of carrying these boats over boulders the size of houses, and they win. at the bottom of Portage Falls, we must now drag all of our equipment around, which takes an even longer period of time. Looking downstream, we can see it's going to be clear sailing for a while. We camp near a beautiful little waterfall, and the water is sweet to drink. It drops on twigs and leaves, eroding the sand away, forming a natural phenomenon we've never seen before, a miniature sand city. The next rapid to be run is similar to those we run in the United States, and we call it Rainbow Rapid. It is a larger rapid we named Gorilla Gorge with a rock at the bottom which looks like the face of a gorilla. A sharp rock in Gorilla Gorge gives boat number two a small tear in its floor. We'll have to stop and patch it. The governor's helicopter has been flying over us every day at 11 o'clock to check on our well-being. The orange flag means that he's to go downriver and land at the nearest available beach. We patch the boat with a special contact cement and finish just as the helicopter spots our flag. We 
flowed down to meet it through the only calm water stretch we encountered in our run through El Sumidero Canyon. The beauty of this canyon, never before seen by man, helps us to forget the hardships we've encountered. people on our expedition who need medical attention. One has either broken or badly sprained his ankle, and the other has been severely weakened by dysentery. Both will have to leave the expedition and return to Tuxla. This spectacular waterfall we named Preston Falls and are the two Dr. Prestons who did so much to make our expedition successful. Time to go back on the river and run the rapids below Preston Falls. There are many rocks here, and though we try to miss them, we're not completely successful. Tricky river currents turn us momentarily upstream, forcing us a little further to the left than we'd like to be. Over a sharp drop we go, losing an oar. We temporarily lost control of the boat, and it looks like we're headed for an unexpected shower bath. boulders dropped off the canyon walls into the river, forming a passage too narrow for our boats. We're going to have to make one more small portage before we can finish our trip. Checking our map, we see we have only one more hazard in the canyon, a waterfall 26 feet high. We name it Finstermaker Falls after Art Finstermaker who guided both boats over this big drop. rapids and the canyon walls gradually disappear. We're finally through El Sumidero Canyon. This is our first chance to relax in 11 days. Natives of the village of Chico Asen are on the beach to see those crazy Americans. And we're given a tour of this typical southern Mexico town by the mayor. Camp at the river's edge and finally have a chance to get everything dry. John Cross Jr. asked Dr. Preston to attend to those injuries he didn't know he had in the excitement of the river run. The next day we make our last portage from the river to the truck. The helicopter arrives bringing a very happy governor to congratulate us on our successful run of the El Sumidero Canyon. This has brought his state much publicity, and he hopes more tourism. We thank him for all of his help and the use of the helicopter and rifle. <laughs> we didn't have the heart to tell him that the rifle had a rusty pen and wouldn't shoot. 
especially after he tells us that after a three-hour truck ride to Tuxla, he is hosting a big fiesta in our honor. The streets are filled with girls in their Chapaneca dresses. As we arrive at the Hotel Bonampak, we hear a familiar sound, the marimba band. Only this time it's not for the celebrities from Mexico City, but for the Americanos. The governor gets the prettiest girls in town to come out and dance with the boatmen in the streets. And it looks like Paul has fully recovered from his accident. That evening, a banquet is given in our honor, and the local ballet dances for us. They are very famous in this part of the world, and it's a great honor to have them perform. A little later in the evening, the boatmen are invited to take part in the dancing. Well, we're satisfied. We've run the El Sumidero Canyon, but we'd like to complete our trip. We plan to come back in one year's time to run that last 60 miles through Malpaso Canyon. All of us return to our homes in the United States. One year later, in the month of January, we start out from Salt Lake City, leaving the snow and cold country behind, heading south to the warmer climate of southern Mexico. Arriving in Tuxla, we decide to take a side trip to visit the village of Zinacantan. This is where the Zinacanteco Indians live, almost cut off from the outside world. At the entrance to their village, a shrine has been set up by the side of the road. These are a very religious people, practicing a mixture of Catholicism and Paganism. It's a good idea to make friends with the youngsters first when entering a new village. We take Polaroid pictures of them and give them to the people as a gift. This young man spends most of his time weaving straw hats. The Zinicantecos wear a special costume, unlike any of the other Indians in Mexico. And they drink hard liquor as part of their religion and daily life. So much so that they had this special leather pouch to carry their alcoholic beverages around with them at all times. They have their own religious hierarchy. And elevation in this religious order, called the cargo system, is a very important part of their lives. We arrive the day of the biggest fiesta of the year, the Festival of San Sebastian. These women are bringing pine needles from the high mountain country to put on the church floor. And the roadways are decorated with greenery throughout the community. The churchyard will be the center of the festivities. The village elders go through the entrance to the churchyard and into the church with the musicians following behind. Everyone has a job for the fiesta. This group of fellows packs an explosive into a miniature cannon and then pounds dirt on top of it. Sticking the fuse in at the last moment, they hold it at arm's length to explode it, this loud noise being their contribution to the festival. Head padding is a combination blessing and greeting and can go on for hours. A typical Zinicanteco house has one room with a dirt floor. Meals consist of tortillas, beans, and coffee eaten twice a day. Most families have their own little altar. The 
popular saint at this time being San Martin. The third day of the fiesta, when most of the activities take place, they have an important ceremony called the Dance of the Bull. sandals on the performers. They are to be found on classic Maya paintings and sculptures dating back to 300 AD. These people are very closely related to the ancient Maya who once inhabited this region in great numbers. We are attracted by the very different sound of music made by these three musicians on some very old instruments. Zenica and Taiko Indian in the village has the smallest instrument, a little two-string violin. Leaving Zenica town, we travel back to Tuxla in the hotel. Here we meet the rest of our group, which now includes our wives, and drive out to the airport to arrange for air transportation to go on a special side trip. We are going to fly to the Guatemalan Mexican border to the Usumacinta River, which is 300 miles south of El Sumidero Canyon. In 11 days, we'll travel 160 miles by river to explore some Mayan archeological sites. Although the Usumacinta River does not have the wild rapids like the Grijalva River, we want to run it to see some Mayan ruins. There are no roads within 100 miles of our starting point on the Usuma Sinta River. Everything will have to be flown into a jungle landing strip close to the starting point of our river run. Our bad luck with airplanes is still with us. We spend one whole day loading this plane only to find out it's been grounded because the pilot isn't properly licensed. So we unload and wait another day for a second plane. This is a B-18, an early World War II bomber. The pilot tells us the B-18 kept falling out of the sky, so our country only made a few of them, which doesn't exactly fill us with confidence. The pilot agrees to fly us in early tomorrow morning. We'll spend the balance of this day loading the plane. We depart almost at sunrise the next day, and we thank the pilot for leaving so early. An uncommon occurrence in this part of the world. He said, well, I didn't do this just to please you, although I'm happy that it does. I left this early because I didn't have a proper license either, and I didn't want to get caught by the airport officials. Our landing strip seems very small, and we're not too sure we'll take a plane this size. It's the first time a B-18 or any plane this large has attempted to land here. We'll fly over first, making a trial run of the field, checking it out to make sure it will accommodate our plane. The pilot decides it will, so in we go on a landing that's very spooky for our nervous river crew. As soon as our wheels hit the ground, our pilot puts on the brakes to stop the plane from going off the other end. He does a tremendous job. The only drawback is 
The field is not quite wide enough. No serious damage, though. Only a dented wing from hitting some of the small trees on the sugarcane plantation. Our cargo is unloaded from the plane, while the local people are requested to make the field at least 30 feet wider for our takeoff. One little grass shack we almost hit on landing had to be purchased and burned. As you can see, it's a very tight takeoff. There are two families who live at Tres Naciones, a heavier chief with his family, and a married son, his wife, and new baby. The chief cuts sugar cane for the family business, while the boys are responsible for squeezing the juice from the cane into this large bath. And one of the younger boys encourages the horsepower. After it's boiled into a syrupy form and poured into these molds for cooling, the sugar cane juice hardens into what we know as raw sugar. This is wrapped in banana leaves and sold to the Guatemalan neighbors. We take some along on the river trip with us and find it greatly enhances our menu. The ladies of Tres Naciones carry their water uphill about a quarter of a mile to do their laundry out of doors. Most work is done outside as the temperatures during the day, even during the winter, stay around 80 degrees. The Guatemalan neighbor arrives with a cayuco full of live turtles he caught in the river. They will be flown out to Mexico City and become someone's turtle soup. The animals in the foreground are called tepesquently, a rodent eaten by the natives and prized for its delicious flavor. We are reluctant to leave this pleasant village and our new friends, but it's time to start motoring down the placid waters of the Usumacinta River. It's warm and humid in the jungle, and Vaughn Featherstone decides to go swimming and cool off. The first village we encounter is Agua Azul, about an hour downriver from Tres Naciones. We stop to visit, mainly to look at the Cayuco they are building on the beach. It will take this man eight hours a day for about eight days to make the Cayuco. And then, like this one, it will be used to travel the river. It looks so simple and fun that we purchased a small one from the natives to use. But we find it's not as easy as it looks. However, Vaughn says, I was watching those guys. This is how you do it. Military macaws are plentiful in the jungle, but this one is a pet and not for sale. So we buy three small green pears to take on the boat with us. Perched on a tree branch, they safely ride through all the small rapids and eat everything in sight. John Brothers enjoys a leisurely afternoon with the other passengers as we motor downriver to a major Mayan site, Yashilan. Discovered in 1696, it has been almost completely explored and many of the most beautiful stelas, or carved stones like this one, have been removed to the National Museum in Mexico City. There are many left, however, and we spend the day hiking through the jungle, exploring ceremonial buildings for examples of Mayan art. Tom Lee, assistant field director for the New World Archaeological Foundation, explains to us that most of these carvings are calendrical dating systems carved between 300 and 900 AD.
buildings are full of large insects. This spider measured 13 inches from leg to leg. Boy, let's get out of here. Most of the beaches along the Usumacinta have jaguar tracks. And it looks as though everything grows extra large in the jungle. If he were alive, he'd make a tasty meal for our turtle mascot. We purchased him at Tres Naciones to save him from his soup fate. After a few days, we return him to the river. At last, we come into the valley of El Cayo, where we'll spend several days camped on this island. Every day we go over to the mainland, cutting our way through the heavy foliage along the river. Once we are back in the jungle underneath the large trees, the walking is much easier. We don't find too much in the way of Maya buildings, but we do make a new discovery. A cave that has broken pieces of pottery on the floor. Tom Lee has a permit from the Mexican government to excavate and lays everything out in a very scientific manner. We use a large screen to sift the dirt and all the items are labeled as to location and depth of soil, then placed in bags to be taken back to the archeological lab in Tuxla. Dozens of bags are filled with pot sherds, bones, teeth, and obsidian blades. Several full skeletons are uncovered and we have to be careful not to damage the bones when removing the dirt from them as demonstrated by Cole's Fennessy. We work late into the night screening everything, trying not to leave behind any artifacts or bones. This is a skeleton of a small child, three or four years of age, which had a jade bead necklace on it. With the last burial, the most important one, we find three whole vessels. It was typical of the Mayas to bury these with persons of importance in a Mayan community. Back at our island camp, we examine the many artifacts we've discovered. Among the pot shirts is a beautiful piece painted between 1200 and 1300 AD. By law, everything belongs to the Mexican government and we'll go to the museum in Tuxla. We keep nothing for ourselves. After spending four days at El Cayo, we once again start motoring down the river, passing Bootsilia Falls, the only really good sized waterfall on the Usumacinta River. It seems our very scientific expedition has collapsed. We brought along these trinkets and toys for the children of the villages, but we just didn't see enough of them. The trip ends just outside of Tenosique, where our truck meets us and takes us to Palenque. The city of Hermosa is not far from Palenque. We hire Cessna 180s to fly us into the seldom visited site called Bonham Park, which in Mayan means painted walls. This is the most famous example of Mayan art in the archaeological world. We could have walked into this site from the Usumacinta River trip, but it would have taken two days of hard walking through the jungle. Although when we see the landing strip, we're not too sure we made the right choice. Three buildings at the top house the famous murals. This is a reproduction of them painted by the Mexican artist Tejeda. The Mayas have depicted themselves at war and in religious ceremonies, giving us valuable information about their civilization.
just outside of these buildings are some magnificently carved stelas. And we think it's miraculous that these stones, standing unprotected through the centuries, have been so well preserved. The carving on the stones is still very detailed. You can even make out the thumbnail on the man's thumb. This is the lower half of the same stone. It's only a five minute hop over the treetops to the nearby village of Loch and Haw. Mexico's famous Loch and Doan Indians live here, the most closely linked people to the ancient Mayas. The Loch and Doan Indians are short in stature and both men and women have long hair and wear a long robe. Sometimes it's hard to tell them apart. We brought a few things along to make friends with the people, and though they like the necklaces and mirrors, the item they find most interesting is nylon rope. This is one of their chiefs, his number two wife, he has four, and their baby. Since the advent of the tourist, He's become very commercial. He now charges five pesos for a close-up. His neighbor's in charge of cooking the village dinner. It's a mixture of various types of Indian corn soaked in a lime water solution. She looks like a living stela. Her features very much like those of her ancestors, the Maya. There are not enough planes for all of the party to visit Bonampak at the same time. So these people will return to Via Hermosa, making the aircraft available for the second group. Today, Signora Blum is here. She's a very famous person in this part of the world. Born in Switzerland, she was kicked out of Germany by Hitler in the late 30s for her anti-Nazi activities. And she came to Mexico where she met and married Franz Blum noted anthropologist. She shows us things we didn't see the day before, beautiful and strange gourd plants. And leaves that shrivel to the human touch. Senora Bloom has done much to help the Lock and Doan Indians, and they are especially friendly today allowing us to take some portrait-type shots of them. These are all men. Watch closely. As we are leaving, one of our planes had a passenger inside taking routine pictures of takeoff. We didn't know the plane was going to crash into another plane parked on the field. There are five people in the wreckage. We try to get them out in a hurry because there is gasoline dripping off the wing tanks onto the hot engine, and we are afraid it will go up in flames. Sure enough, seconds after the last person is taken out, they ignite. The only remaining plane flies the two most seriously injured people to the hospital in Via Hermosa, an hour's flight away. Because it's late afternoon, the rest of us will have to stay overnight in the jungle waiting for replacement aircraft to pick us up the next morning. The next day, in the burned wreckage, we find one of my cameras and Coles Fennessy, senior editor of Sports Illustrated magazine, has lost all of his film and camera equipment.
We must clear the wreckage from the airfield so that the replacement aircraft can land. In talking with our pilot, he explains the accident by telling us that as the other pilot was taking off, he was blinded by the late afternoon sun coming through his windshield. Being afraid of going off the runway or hitting the trees at the end of it, he pulled back on the controls to make the plane airborne before he had proper ground speed. The plane went up and stalled out, coming back down and crashing into another plane which was parked on the field. The parked plane absorbed the impact, undoubtedly saving several lives. We learn later that the most seriously injured person has only a broken leg. The Lock and Don Indians help us remove all the airplane wreckage and its hard work in the tropical heat. As payment to these people for their help, rather than give them money, we give them 22 rifle shells. There's no place to spend money here, and they can use the shells to hunt for food in the jungle. Here come the two replacement airplanes to take us back to Via Hermosa. We can't believe our eyes. The second plane in goes off the runway and gets stuck in the mud. It takes all of us to get him back on the runway. Everybody wants to ride the blue plane, and nobody wants to ride in the red one. Over the jungle we fly to Via Hermosa to check on our two friends in the hospital. They are doing fine, and their only regret is they're going to miss the rest of our trip. As they lie in their hospital bed, they'll have many memories to keep them company. They reminisce on past river trips, which gave them the experience they needed to challenge the unexplored rivers of Mexico. most exciting memories were of Grand Canyon. The rapids of Grand Canyon were difficult and provided excellent training for these river explorers. A special boat called the J-Rig was designed specifically for the rapids of Grand Canyon. It is 34 feet long, 15 feet wide, and when loaded with cargo weighs over 10,000 pounds but it sails through the rapids with ease. Motors are used to control the boat. Small at first, the rapids of Grand Canyon gradually become larger and wilder. Not only were the rapids exciting, the hikes were fun too. Depending on the weather, the water of the Colorado River was many colors, from deep green to muddy brown. The Lava Pinnacle told them that Lava Falls was the next rapid.
there are memories of many spirited water fights. and calm canyon evenings. Crystal Rapid provided plenty of excitement. At Horn Rapid, they learn how different water levels affect rapids. With high water, Horn Rapid was an easy run with hardly a bounce. With medium water, it became a little rougher. And at low water, Horn almost swallowed our boat. They topped off the boat before taking on Granite Rapids. A quick check of the map showed them that Hermit Rapid was next. Slow motion makes it look easy. This is regular speed.
memories. Our hospitalized friends have some exciting ones while we are off on a new adventure. Before finishing our trip down the Grijalva River, we make a short run over to the west coast of Mexico for an eight-day ocean cruise from Puerto Vallarta to San Blas. There's not much of a road coming into Puerto Vallarta, and we have to cross the river several times. At one spot, we rescue an automobile from the river with the help of a couple of youngsters dressed for the climate. Obviously, the roads weren't meant for our large truck, but we finally reach Puerto Vallarta and unload. This is our first attempt at an ocean excursion, but we were tempted to make the trip because we had heard so much about the beautiful coastline between Puerto Vallarta and San Blas. This time, we use a generator and vacuum cleaners to blow up our boats. It works very well and certainly beats the hand pumping we did on the El Sumidero trip. The native children play while we work, and in no time we're ready to go. Plane ride gives us a view of the coastline along which we'll be traveling. We'll anchor our raft offshore each night and use a small boat to go into the beaches to camp. leisurely trip, a hobo type of vacation. There's lots of time to read, write, sunbathe, fish, sleep, eat, or do anything that's of a restful nature. There are plenty of provisions, most of which we purchased in Puerto Vallarta. One big difference between a river trip and an ocean trip is the rolling motion. We troll for fish, and the fishing is very good, except when the sharks are around. We shoot at them to scare them away, and the fishing picks up. We catch dozens of different kinds of fish. This is typical of the camps along the west coast, all of them with beautiful white sandy beaches. With a clear water ocean right at your front door, you can go swimming night or day. It's always warm. Cooking breakfast is a difficult task in a tropical area. Wood is very damp and hard, making it difficult to get a fire going in the morning. But soon we're on our way, rocking along. We stop to explore the endless miles of sandy beaches. In some places we find hermit crabs by the thousands, each carrying his own little borrowed home on his back. When he outgrows it, he discards it for another one, sometimes using a bottle cap or other weird object for his house. This is truly a tropical paradise, one of those places you read or hear about, but don't really think exists. Whales are sighted in large numbers. The 
You can't get too close to them, so we have to use the telephoto lens to get pictures. We've used up more gasoline than we anticipated fighting the ocean currents. So we stop at a small village to get gas. People of the community try to sell us some genuine bona fide artificial imitation artifacts, which they claim they found while building their palm frond houses. We find that the nearest spot to get gasoline is many miles away. We'll have to pack our empty cans on mules and transport them overland through the jungle. It will take Henry most of the day before he can return with a full load of gasoline. continue along the beautiful and rocky shores of the west coast of Mexico, enjoying the playful porpoise who accompany us much of the way. Fishing isn't too good when they're around, but we enjoy them for the endless hours of entertainment they provide as they swim around our rafts. We throw out double anchors front and back to secure our raft. shore to a coconut plantation to purchase one of the few items we don't have in our store of supplies. This was a completely unexpected sale for the family living here. The last time they had visitors was three months ago. crew look forward to fresh coconut milk for dinner. We arrive at our last camp Next morning, we get quite a surprise. Something has happened to our surf overnight. We're having a hard time getting out to our raft. In fact, it becomes quite a challenge. the waves and make it back to the raft. It's only an hour from here to San Blas, the end of our trip, and it's a good thing some of our food is spoiled, like these eggs. Now you wouldn't think he'd catch two in a row. Finally, we're ready to finish our El Sumidero trip. The road is a familiar one, as we traveled it one year ago when we entered our El Sumidero expedition. We approached the little town of Chico Ascent. A little stream flowing into the main river is the lifeblood of the community. 
They use it for agricultural purposes and drinking water and also as a local laundromat and the community bathhouse. Our rafts, 28 foot pontoons, are tied in two sets of two and powered with 20 horse outboard motors to push us down through the first 30 miles of slow water. The last 30 miles are filled with rapids and will separate our boats running the rapids with oars. We'll stop and look at the first one and try to find a good path through it. It's so rocky, we name it Pinball, but that certainly is what our boats will look like going through this rapid. There's not a clear shot anywhere. So let's test it first with just boatmen in the boats. We'll soften the nose of the boat to take the blows in case we hit any rocks or canyon walls. three boats came through safely, all of the remaining passengers desire to ride, and it makes number four boat just a little heavy. stop to eat, and there's not a dry hair in the bunch. In all of our trips in Mexico, we've only seen two snakes. And every group has its Tarzan. Rapid number two is very narrow and rocky at the opening. Number two boat makes the perfect run because it is very light with only boatmen in it. Number four has the remaining passengers in it, and it's a little hard to steer because of the extra weight.
get a little excited for a moment until we find it's only the boatman. We decide to call this fallout wrap. Another problem we're having is demonstrated to us by Gary Brown, one of our boatmen, as his solid oak ore breaks. If we break many more, we won't have enough to complete our trip. We camp above the last big rapid, the largest one in the canyon. Tying our boats to the broken oar, we bury it. We call this a dead man, and it's our way of securing the boats for the night when there are no trees nearby. And if you've just fallen out in a rapid, maybe you can talk a pretty girl into washing your back. We are a very anxious group next morning as we are about to go through Real Del Cedro Rapid. We'll test it first with Jess Boatman shooting our pictures in slow motion. is normal speed. Here comes good old heavy number four. down here calling no see him. And it's true you don't see him, but boy, you sure feel him. Our only injury, a stub toe in camp, is attended to by Dr. Richard Preston. On our last day, we approach the Mopasso Dam, which has since flooded out this area. It is lost forever to river runners. There's a great feeling of satisfaction among the entire party that they had a chance to run Mopasso before it was lost, and an even greater feeling of accomplishment for the El Sumidero crew, for at last, they have completed their run of the Wild River.